Let's just take a moment and, and pray together. Good and gracious God, we thank you for your word. It's a light to our feet. Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and move among us that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be found worthy in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our script today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15 and verses 1 through 11. Jesus is speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Isaiah declares that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you are visiting with us today, you will know that we are between sermon series. Last week, we had uh, Dr. Ephraim Smith come, and he preached on Revelation chapter 7. And in, in that, you'll remember there is this picture of heaven that we see of of all the nations of the earth coming before the throne of God and worshiping him. And he spoke about how, you know, in, in one sense, to get to heaven, you have to die. Uh, you know, but the other piece of that that he, he touched on was also for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, uh, that requires the laying down of our lives. And so in various ways as we lay down our lives, a heaven indeed comes in greater measure on earth as it is in heaven. Prior to that, we were in John chapter 14. Next week, we're going to be in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, as we're carrying on with our Following Jesus series. And so today, I thought we would just move from John 14 into John 15, a little Lectio Continua, and, and that really is about what we see here, the vine and the vine dresser. So I'm going to make a sweeping statement. I am not ordinarily given to making sweeping statements, but I'm going to make one now. What we think about God is the most important accomplishment of our lives. See, we all believe and worship something. Someone who's Christian, someone who is Muslim, someone who is an atheist. We all believe and worship that as we give our lives to something. Uh, it may be an idea. Uh, it may be our own intelligence. We may elevate that above everything else. It may be money, it may be power, it may be family, it may be ideology, it may be pleasure-seeking, any number of things. But whatever we ascribe ultimate importance to in life, whether how we live our lives or through some kind of creed, which may or may not be explicit, that thing is our God. And we worship it, we give our lives to it, and, and it is expressed as we live out our lives. It defines our character, nature, and the quality of our lives. What we think about God is the most important accomplishment of our lives. So uh, Christians are, are human beings who believe that we are not alone in this universe, that indeed there is one of far greater intelligence and power who, who actually brought all that we see into being, all that we uh, receive through our senses. This, this world 
our solar system, indeed the universe. For our, my Marvel friends out there, one who is way more powerful than the celestials. If we were to encounter this being, as Scripture says, one who dwells in unapproachable light, if we encountered God with unveiled glory, his presence would simply consume us because he is so powerful. A God doesn't want that. It was God's delight and joy to create us, to call us into being. God actually wants to be in relationship with us. So how, how does that happen? He's made it possible in and through the person of Jesus. But in various ways, as we read the biblical account, we see how God has revealed God's self to us over the centuries as he has encountered humanity in different ways. And, and ultimately, um, these ways are revelations of God's self in part and veiled, but sufficient for us to know God, love God, and ultimately be with God. So I have a friend, Tim Harbin. He is a retired uh, pastor. He's an author. And he, uh, he talks about God's self-revelation in the Bible. Uh, in, in he, he gives this idea of, 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 of a kingdom paradigm. He talks about this idea, which in, in some ways it's essentially a metaphor Ways that God has spoken and revealed God's self. One would be the bride and the bridegroom, right? God has revealed this, this picture to us. We see it in the book of Song of Songs, in Hosea, Ephesians, Revelation. Another would be as the good father. So Jesus, as we see in his prayer life and in his ministry and teaching, prays to Abba, Father. And we also see how how God has, you know, in Jesus, his, his parables, the, the, the prodigal son, for instance, is another one of these uh, paradigms, metaphors, uh, facets, if you like, of God's revealed person. He's also revealed as healer, as a rock of salvation, a cornerstone on which to build our lives, uh, a kind of a, a foundation to lay our lives upon, a shelter, a refuge. I think of these things as kind of facets of a diamond. You know, God has given us this rich gift of himself and has revealed it in sort of various facets, if you like, that are of immense value to us. If we can just see it and recognize it. And they are important because they help us know and, and ultimately get to love God as God would have us. I think another well-known one is, is the good shepherd. There are references to God as a shepherd in Genesis, in the Psalms, in Ezekiel. Uh, probably the most well-known one would be Psalm 23, where David talks about the Lord as his shepherd and describes God as one who guards, who guides, who comforts, who restores believers, his sheep, uh, through life, with its dark valleys with its green pastures, and even with its enemies. God's revealed self. And I think as you read Psalm 23, you kind of get that sense of David, who himself was a shepherd, kind of going about his life and God speaking to him and, and just receiving uh, this sort of deep relationship with God in and through his lived life as in prayer he was speaking to God. And then he shares that with us. Today, as we come to this text, we encounter God as both vine and vine dresser. And my encouragement to you today is to perhaps a takeaway from today is to consider, you know, which of the ways in which God's self-revelation in Scripture is one that perhaps resonates. Um, I've mentioned several there, but there may be another. And I'd encourage you to, to go away and spend some time thinking about this. We, uh, clearly, David was someone who who thought a lot about God as a shepherd in his life. I'd encourage you to do that because whilst these facets, if you like, are all important, I think our own life stories and, and how we have lived life and the things that have happened to us may mean that some of these things are perhaps especially relevant to us as we, as we learn and grow in the knowledge and love of God. So in John 15... 
we, we encounter this, this paradigm, this um, understanding of God as vine and vine dresser. It is not the only place where God is seen as one who, in many ways, is like a gardener, one who sows seed, one who uh, nurtures the growth of living things. In Psalm 80, it begins with, uh, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Continuing in verse 8, You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Isaiah takes this metaphor up in chapter 5 of the book that bears his name. Speaking of God, he says, My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Some versions translate that sour grapes. In other words, the good fruit that God had wanted was not produced. And so in Isaiah 5 and in Psalm 80, we see how God allows for the wall of protection uh, to be destroyed and the vineyard to be trampled. And uh, the, the Old Testament prophets equate this with the coming of the Assyrian and the Babylonian invasion. For, as it says in Isaiah 5, he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. And so the, the reality is that, that, that Israel uh, at the time certainly in, engaged in two essential sins. One was idolatry, where they sought after the, the Baals, Ashtaroths, and essentially the, the, the idols of the surrounding nations. And the second thing that the prophets continually um, bring before the people of Israel is, is the injustice that the leaders actually engaged in or turned a blind eye to. And so the concern ultimately that the fruit that God had wanted to see was not ultimately produced. And so in our reading today, Jesus, in one of his seven I am statements, says to them, I am the true vine. The fruitfulness the Father desires is found in the one true vine, that is Jesus. The vine dresser, that is the Father, cares about his people. He desires to see Good fruit. He desires them to bear good fruit in their lives. He wants good things for them and from them. And he's made a way for that to happen. And that way is by their relatedness to his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus speaks of that relatedness as, as a relationship of a vine and its branches. And as we read this, we see that there are two kinds of branch. And I want us to be thinking a little bit about, about these two kinds of branch today. See, there's one kind that bears fruit, and there is a kind that does not. Some of you know, when I was a kid, I lived in, in Durban, South Africa. So that's a tropical climate out there. Uh, we're pretty close to the Tropic of Capricorn. And so it was humid, a kind of Floridian. And we had all sorts of fruit that grew in our yard. We had mango trees, we had guava trees, we had... Uh, granadillas, which I think you would understand as passion fruit. And right in the middle of our front yard, we had an avocado tree. And the thing about this tree, so the Dickinsons, bar none, love avocados, we love guacamole. It's kind of a thing. We do. But the problem with this tree was it refused to bear fruit, which was somewhat annoying. And so I remember I was having this conversation one evening around the dinner table. Now, what could we do to encourage our tree to be fruitful. And I have no idea, my mum's here today, I have no idea quite where it came from, but I think it was my dad came up with this idea that, no, no, we should hammer some nails into the trunk of the tree uh, because, you know, it would provide some essential minerals and this would, you know, nurture fruit growth. Um, so we did. We must have hammered about 20 nails into the tree. And the other thing we did was pray. We prayed that the tree would bear fruit and it did. <laughs> One lousy avocado. But we had some fruit. <laughs> and I think, I think simply because that happened, we said, you know what? We'll let it live. 
Because honestly, uh, if it hadn't, that would have been it. And I say that because of the importance of highlighting, you know, it is important for a fruit tree to actually bear fruit. (laughs) That's what it's intended to do. The second branch that Jesus is referring to is one that does not bear fruit. And it should make us pause for thought, right? Because Jesus is talking about those who live in close proximity to him. Like this is a branch of the vine. You know, Christians are people who say Jesus is Lord, who go to church. And the implication is that that kind of level of closeness, that, you know, people who are at least part of the the faith community. I think the implication here is, is perhaps of a person who attends church potentially for years, may say the right things at the right time, but when all is said and done, their hearts are far from God. They may be neutral, maybe even hostile. I want you to remember, before too much anxiety builds, I want you to remember the context of what Jesus is saying here. We've just come to the end of chapter 14 in our study of John 14, and the last words there were, rise, let us go from here. They've come to the end of what we call the Last Supper, and as Jesus talks about the vine, the vine dresser and the branches, they are moving to Gethsemane. They are on the way there as he is saying this, having just had a conversation within which Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And it's actually at that time that Judas gets up and leaves. He goes out from them. I think one of the things that I struggle to wrap my mind around is how Judas was able to walk with Jesus for the time that he did to encounter the wisdom of Jesus, the kindness of Jesus, the provision of Jesus, the healing of Jesus, the deliverance of Jesus for three years and then do what he did. Something else we know about Judas was that he was the money keeper, right? The, as we read the Gospels, he was the one who kept the common purse and we, we know that he stole from it. And we also know that He actually sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which perhaps gives us some insight into what was of ultimate importance for Judas. He went out from them. John, in his first epistle, second chapter in verse 19, writes, They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they were not of us. He's speaking about a group who were essentially part of the church, part of the the, the faith community John was a part of, but that ultimately left. And later in the chapter, it says that uh, they denied that Jesus was the Christ. Fruitfulness is of great concern to the Father, and it's important to Jesus. You know, elsewhere, he, we, we sort of see his interaction with this barren fig tree. He, he's seeking fruit, but there is none. And he curses it and it withers because it was not doing what it was intended to do. In Matthew 7, as Jesus comes toward the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount, he warns the people of false prophets and says in verse 18, A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Then he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but one who does the will of my Father in heaven. That relatedness has expression in our lives. And I do think... uh, These are sobering verses, right? I think they should be. I think they should make us stop and reflect about, you know, how is our Christian faith expressed? What does that look like? 
Is it real or tangible? That thing of, you know, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, could someone actually accuse you of being a Christian? Is there evidence of that in your life? See, Jesus was called Lord by Judas. But when it came right down to it, he didn't mean it. And ultimately, that showed in his life. So I think this text, uh, there's a cautionary part to this text for us, as well as an exhortation to, to let the word of Christ dwell richly in our lives. Because it's as we, as we do that, as we put ourselves uh, in relationship to Christ, that, that our lives, our spiritual lives are healthy and fruitful. What does that mean, though? Like, what does it mean to be fruitful? We're talking about this, but what is that? Like, you know, we don't grow apples on ourselves. So I think, firstly, what it does not mean is, is having the most money or the most friends or the most kids. That's a very different kind of fruitfulness. Best looks, finest clothes, biggest yard, biggest TV, although big TV, big TV is very nice. Let's, let's just say that. I don't think it's those things. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Uh, I was trying to think of, well, what, what would be an example? And I was listening to the Joy FM a few weeks ago. I like to tune into that. And there was a story about a beekeeper, you know, because most of us just, you know, live ordinary lives with, you know, we go about. Uh, and I don't know if you came across this story, but there was a beekeeper who a few weeks ago was uh, called to a baseball game. Now, there was this game between the L.A. Dodgers and the Arizona Diamondbacks, which you may or may not have heard of, depending on whether or not you like baseball. But so as they wanted to begin the game, attached to the back, I guess it's called backstop netting. I don't know a huge amount about baseball. But uh, attached to the netting, there was this massive clump of bees. And of course, the concern being, what if a fly ball flies up and hits them? You're going to have a lot of very angry bees doing a lot of very mean stuff to the crowd. And so they were like, well, we need to do something about this. And so they called uh, a local beekeeper. It was a Saturday, and he was at his son's t-ball game. Now, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do in that situation? Because not only is it your day off, but there are tens of thousands of people who are depending on you. Talk about pressure. But he said yes. And he went and he was able, I guess it took a couple hours to, to kind of get all those bees. That to me is kindness. Like there's plenty of things he could have been doing on his day off. In fact, he was doing at his son's game a lot of pressure to deal with these bees, but he does. And that's to me, speaks of kindness. Kindness won out the day. Mother Teresa once said, not all of us can do great things on this earth, but we can all do small things with great love. In Galatians 5, and 23, Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control, faithfulness, gentleness, and says against such things there is no law. These are things that God requires, that just God desires to see in our lives. God wants these things from us. I guess as we, as we leave today, I don't want people to go away with this great sense of anxiety. Am I bearing fruit? Am I you know, a fruit-bearing branch or something? That's not uh, the intention here. I also don't think we should be concerned about, well, I think that person there is a withering branch versus, oh, that's a living branch over there with lots of fruit. That's, that's, not, that's not what this is getting at. That's for us all to kind of consider for ourselves. You know, are these things being expressed in our lives? And I, I guess my encouragement, my second encouragement for us is to, to go away today and to consider our relationship with God. You know, since you've been a Christian, do you see evidence of some of these things growing in your life? And to celebrate that and pray and give thanks to God for that. But there may be other things in your life in this list that you think, you know, 
I could see more fruitfulness in this area or in that area. And to come to God in prayer about that and to, and to ask God for that. In fact, Jesus says in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is actually part of God's plan and purpose for us, to see more of this in our lives. That is a prayer that God says yes to. But it does require that we abide in him and in his word. Abide in my love, says Jesus. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Which I find interesting. I think sometimes we think that if we grow in love, then we will do what God says. Jesus sort of has that the other way around here and says, you know, keep my commandments, then you will abide in my love. And I, don't, I think sometimes we maybe react a little bit against this idea of, of obedience per se. But the reason God and, and Jesus is, is telling us about this here is, is not to kind of make us feel overwhelmed or burdened, but because in that place, that is where we experience God's love. It's as we, as we walk, as we follow after Christ in his footsteps, that we do encounter the goodness of God and know and experience his love and its outworking in our lives. It is for our good. We realize this as we live into that truth and in the light of his love. In that place, we will be fruitful. He says, I have spoken this to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. He wants fullness of joy in our lives. What we think about God is the most important accomplishment of our lives. Let's pray together. Good and gracious God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that you desire to be in relationship with us, one who is so, so different from us, holy and, and, and omnipotent and omniscient and, and God, and yet delights in, in us, desires to be in relationship with us, desires that we come to a knowledge of who you are and your great saving love for us. Father, we recognize that you desire that we know you and abide in your love, that we walk in your ways and that we have lives that bear the, the fruit that comes from the very character of Christ. Lord God, we are thankful as we look back over our lives for the various ways in which your presence in our lives have nurtured these things like love and joy and peace and patience. Father, we're mindful perhaps also of areas where we do need to, to grow in these things. And we offer that to you, Father, and say, please help us. Holy Spirit, come in greater measure. Fill us. Perhaps if we need a little pruning, God, you, you know best. We know ultimately that it is the best for us to abide in you and in your love. And because that is the best for us, we say, have your way with us, good and gracious God. In whose name we pray. Amen.